that he would make uh, a blanket statement like that. We kind of know what he meant with regard to the history of the United States and the struggle between private and uh, government. But um, he probably wasn't thinking about the space industry at that time, because the space industry was certainly the enabler of the future of, of our economy, of our species, and all the things that some of our people are going to talk about today. Well, we're going to fast forward now to 2023, and we're using the Artemis mission as sort of the focal point for picking up this discussion about government involvement in space and commercial space and how commercial space can evolve properly and how it is evolving. So we're going to be talking to uh, four people who will be able to, I think, direct us uh, along the lines of that conversation. So. You know, if you ever wanted to ask uh, Rick Tumlinson or anyone uh, why space, now's your chance because uh, he's here among others. So before we do uh, get into the conversation, Tamara, I think we've got some things to talk about. Yes, we do. Yeah, and one of those things is to thank the people who sponsor and support us. Space News Magazine, of course, our media sponsor. And Deborah Werner is here today to give her a significant digits report. Uh, we really appreciate the sustained support from Luxembourg, from Astroscale, from Druva Space. Uh, you can meet in uh, New York tomorrow at the Empire Space uh, cocktail um, party and also World Teleport Association. Speaking of Empire Space, their meet and greet happy hour takes place tomorrow from 6 to 8. And you can be a part of that by following that link. So we hope to see you there. And as we always do to start off these roundtables, we'd like to show you a video that we think is thematic of some of the things we're gonna dive into today. So Tamara. <laughs> When the first people from planet Earth went into space, it was the thrill of a lifetime. But we didn't stay there long. The next time people went into space, they traveled much further, and we got even more excited. But we didn't stay long there either. While people were going out and coming back, we put machines into space to get things done, like bringing you television forecasting the weather, saving lives at sea, and relieving disasters on land, selling you stuff and exploring the planets, keeping the peace, helping farmers grow more food, educating millions and connecting billions. Not always a big thrill, but always making people's lives back on Earth better. The third time we went into space, we decided to stay a while. But we still didn't go far from home. That's about to change. Companies big and small are starting to invest billions of dollars in the high frontier of space. In cheaper and more reliable ways to go there and come back. In technologies to survive in places far from the air and warmth and light of Earth in ways to find resources and use them to manufacture what we need there and power our spacecraft so that we can build places to live and work, to make money and make a life in space for hundreds, then thousands, then millions of people. People whose work will benefit those of us still living on Earth with new products and services we can hardly imagine today. We've been telling stories and making plans about it for more than a century. Now, someone starting a career today can help make it happen. And someone starting school tomorrow could wind up in a job with the best view in the solar system. It will be hard. The risks are high. The technology is still being put to the test and the business potential is far from certain. But for the first time since people began going into space, the opportunity is within our grasp. Not just to go out and come back to show that we can do it, 
to go and build a way of life that reaches as far as the light from our sun, to make sure that whatever happens to our fragile, beautiful world, humanity will always have a home in the universe. Space and satellite, the world's invisible, indispensable technologies, today and tomorrow. Brought to you by Space and Satellite Professionals International, with the support of Blue Origin. And uh, that is from our Better Satellite World video catalog series. And we'd like to thank Blue Origin uh, for their support in helping us make that. Well, it's, uh, it's obviously setting the tone for what we want to talk about today. Um, and as we always do, I wanted to hand it over to Deborah Warner uh, from Space News Magazine, who at, in, on uh, October 17th, uh, in the issue of Space News, if you look it up, had a terrific article uh, that relates directly to what we're going to be talking about today. I'll read you the first sentence. Government funding for the space sector is helping blunt the impact of decline in private investment. Uh, so private sector year to date, Deborah says was about 11.6 billion with 289 rounds. But to give more substance to what that means within the context of whether maybe the commercial sector is getting a little soft, um, I'm gonna turn it over to you, Deborah. Welcome. Thank you very much. Nice to join you. Um, I think there is a widespread widespread belief that in the long term, uh, people will win, wean themselves off government contracts, government funding. But many of the new space technologies um, that will enable all of these new businesses um, in orbit, government is the anchor customer, uh, government research and development funding is helping to reduce the technical risk and make it more palatable for investors. Um, so for the moment, uh, government support has been, is really important to the startup side, which I follow the most closely. Yeah, there, in your piece, Deborah, you say there's a, there was a 20% increase in government funding in the US. So there, there's like a silver lining. I think you're quoting someone there. Uh, I, I am. That was from Deloitte uh, Consulting. And what we saw was after incredible um, uh, private investment flowing into the space sector in 2021, it has dipped in the last couple of years. It hasn't been a tremendous decrease. Um, right. It went from about 12 billion at its peak to about 8 billion now. Uh, but that's still a very significant pot of money. Um, and so one thing I see is companies from all over the world coming to the US to establish offices, to turn themselves into US entities so that they can get a piece of that government funding. Right. And you, you also go on to say there that um, when you were reporting this or one uh, a decade ago, 75% uh, of all space U.S. government spending was via traditional contracts following uh, federal acquisition regulations. But that's been that's shifted. That's gone down. Right. What, what's the significance of that? Well, in the old days, the government came up with voluminous requirements and that process could take many years to determine what they needed. And then they looked for companies that could do exactly that. And there were only a handful. And those companies, by the way, got their hands in earlier to draft those requirements with their government uh, colleagues. And so it took a long time. These were cost plus contracts. And it was a decade between um, new programs. Uh, government ha has found ways through other transaction authorities and other means to speed that up. And in some cases to buy what the commercial sector already is building, like mm -hmm. a small satellite that they could put a sensor on and test what they wanted. Um, so it, it is shifting. It's not, um, it's at the pace of government, but it is shifting. Yeah. 
So, I mean, is it is it reasonable to say, and I'm asking you to maybe editorialize based on some of the reporting, but is it, I mean, is it fair to say that the commercial sector has sort of begun to infuse itself so significantly uh, in the sector that sort of organically we're beginning to see more commercial involvement and, you know, by definition, less government? Or is that not accurate? Well, especially, um, I would say on the satellite communication side, look at the broadband constellations. Government customers are very important anchor customers, but they are providing uh, satellite communication services all over the world. And that market is growing. And if our demand for data is any indication, it will continue to grow. Yeah. Um, you also conclude the piece by talking about innovation, you know, who's innovating and where. Um, and you allude, or you, again, I think it's I think it's Don Clausen from ST Engineering who's being quoted there. Uh, he says, you know, with all of the conflict that we're seeing now, you might see a drop in innovation. Um, again, what what are you seeing out there in terms of impacts uh, on the industry? Yeah, that was interesting. Um... And obviously he's talking about, I mean, there there are great um, great space companies in the Middle East and there are great space companies in Russia and Ukraine. So he was talking mm -hmm. about supply chain disruptions and right. some of that, but I don't see innovation slowing down. I see incredible innovation in this sector as people wake up to the possibilities. Yeah, and we'll be asking uh, Rick and... Barbara, uh, whether they see a slowdown in innovation uh, as we get into this. Um, Deborah, that's, a, that's, again, as usual, great reporting. Um, what are you working on now? Anything we need to keep our, well, we always keep our eye open for your work. So, of Anything going on? One thing I'm very interested in right now is called innovation theater. When um, a government agency, for example, talks about um, buying everything that it possibly can and only building what it must, um, is that true or is that innovation theater? Okay, well, we'll be looking for that. Um, listen, you're, you're, you're great. You're terrific as always, and we really appreciate it. And uh, obviously, we hope you stick around and maybe join us uh, at the end of this for the conversation. I will. I'm looking forward to hearing it. Deborah Warner from Space News, thanks again. Okay. Um, before we uh, introduce our guests, I want to introduce my colleague, uh, Joe Fargnoli from the New York Space Alliance. Joe will come in at the end to give us his reaction in the New York Minute. But um, Joe, what, what are we going to be looking for today? Hey, thanks, Lou. And nice to be here with everybody today. You know, this topic uh, really came up from a conversation we were having over a full liter of Pellegrino. Um, well, we looked at the historical cost of Falcon 9, right? Falcon 9 version 1.0 1, 1 uh, first launched in roughly June 2010. And um, we are now looking at an evolution of Falcon 9 where we went from $65,000 per kilogram to today about $1.5,000 per kilogram. So the evolution of Falcon over the last 13 years has been a monumental shift in the launch industry. We're now November 15th, 2023, 48 hours away from hopefully a Starship launch. I suggest that Starship launch, I think many suggest Starship launch will represent another inflection point in the progression of the commercial space industry. Elon is saying that in a couple of years, Starships should get down to $10 million per launch with 100,000 kilograms going to LEO. We're looking at sub $100 per kilogram. So the earth is gonna shift yet again. Wonderful progression. But we look at this in light of considering government launch programs like Artemis, like SLS. And we ask ourselves the question, has the commercial model moved so quickly, so far, that we need to rethink about the model of interplay between government launch procurement and the progression of commercial industry? When we discussed this, we looked at comparisons to like the aviation industry. The government does not build every commercial airliner or any commercial airliners that are used. However, there are certain custom applications where the government does build their own aircraft. So we ask ourselves this monumental question. You know, I, I, again, I go back to the Iridium constellation. It was a great idea when it first was, was conceived. The cellular industry took off, the terrestrial cellular industry took off really quickly and made it out, made it an outdated business model. 
So given the state of how quickly we've advanced and launched and the monumental shift that Starship represents and that some of the Blue Origin vehicles represent, are we in the right frame of thinking about how the government should approach its launch needs? Okay. So I think we've got a great panel to dig into this very issue. Yeah, and that, that is that is key. So, uh, well, listen to uh, what they say, Joe, and you can respond at the end. Appreciate you starting us off. Okay, well, let's uh, let's meet our guests. Uh, we're delighted uh, to have three people here, although two of them are here now. I don't know if Jeff's with us yet, but uh, first I'd like to introduce Barbara Belvisi. Barbara is an entrepreneur who started her career in the private equity and venture capital sector, where she was able to work with entrepreneurs, obviously her passion, uh, after investing and serving as the CFO for hardware startups. She helped found Hardware Club, now HCVC, uh, which invests and supports those who build the world. It's a really nice phrase. She also participated in the launch of several innovation programs like Hello Tomorrow uh, about five years ago in 2017, six years ago. She left her uh, investor career and started learning engineering and architecture. Driven by her childhood passion for nature and space, she spent a year with NASA engineers prior to launching Interstellar Lab in 2018, where she is today and where we find her. The company focuses on preserving life on Earth and expanding it in space. Barbara is a top 10 woman in tech in France, top 100 uh, Forbes in Europe, best innovator 2022. Um, and she, we hope she's everything, including a, a New York Yankee fan. Barbara, welcome. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you for, for the wonderful introduction. All true. Um, well, it's, it's great to have you here. Also with us today is Rick Tumlinson. Um, to, you know, I don't want to go to the cliche, a guy who needs no introduction. So I'm going to introduce him um, for those of you who may have been literally on another planet and don't know who he is. But Rick is one of the most influential people in our industry and a genuine space visionary. Uh, he's credited with coining the term new space. You ever heard that one? And helped create the new commercial space industry hi highlighted by uh, Elon Musk and Jeff Bezos and, and many, many others. Uh, he founded Houston Space Fund Venture uh, Capital Company uh, with, I believe, 20 companies in the portfolio, probably more now. And he's also a U.S. Space Force Doctrine Organization Group member. He's a writer, a speaker. He appears before Congress as a witness. Uh, for our purposes, talking about the commercial and government relations, he signed the first private astronaut uh, to fly to the International Space Station, led the commercial takeover of the Russian Mir uh, space station, helped start the first mission to find water on the moon, signed the first ever space commercial data purchase agreement, was part of a group that began NASA's Lunar Exploration Analysis Group and co-founded the Space Frontier Foundation. Finally, he is a recipient of the World Technology Award along with Craig Venter of the Human Genome Project. Uh, Rick, have I left anything out? No, but I'm going to have to send you a check for that. So, <laughs> well, listen, it's great. <laughs> Thank you. It's great to have you both. Um, well, you know, Barbara, let me start with you. Um, I'm going to ask it's sort of the big question that we've all been thinking about here, which is, are we seeing a bridge that is moving us from government to commercial? I mean, you know, if if companies I won't name them, like Boeing keeps sucking down the money for launch and the industry. Uh, it takes money off the table. But are, are we are we are we literally moving in in the right direction in your view when you look at your entrepreneurial community? Um, um, well, what I can see, and it's it's the case for us, but it's for for many of my uh, fellow space entrepreneur. Um, we start up trying not to put all our eggs in the same basket. So not to rely only on governmental contract to move forward. Um, and so with having more VC money coming, coming into, into the game, it forces us to find terrestrial application and, and scalable and, and sustainable business model. So we will not only rely on governmental money to finance the development of our product, but we will actually make revenue on Earth first, especially when there are long, um, um, you know, long product development, 
Um, and so, and I see this trend coming in, like the, the, the question every VC will ask a space company is, okay, what's, what's your business model? How do you make money <laughs> in the coming years and not mm. 10 years from now? Um, so, so, so I think right now it's like really a combination of both and the commercial part is, is, is kind of like taking over. <laughs> yeah. So, so you do see that sort of evolution that Deborah Warner and I were talking about. Yeah, uh, within the ecosystem, and again, your your model, which I want to talk about later at Interstellar, uh, may be an example. Um, you know, Rick, you've got an event coming up, New Worlds event. Um, you know, are we in a new world with regard to what we're trying to accomplish here? Finding the right balance between government and commercial, or is is the subject sort of much more complicated than we're trying to tackle yes, today? Uh uh, yeah, and speaking of complicated, I do want to clear up something. Um, I didn't coin the term new space. It was uh, members of the Space Frontier Foundation okay. um, that, that coined the term. Uh, I helped define it, and we've been pushing for it. But, um, And, uh, you know, we're, I don't know, we're, we are moving towards new worlds. And I, I want to, I, I believe, I mean, this the, 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 the timing of this meeting is almost historic, right? If... Mm. Um, I, I tell in my tell people when I'm doing my lectures that, um, if and when either Elon, Jeff, um, or you know Firefly or Rocket Lab perfect 100% reusable spaceships. By the way, I'm trying to remind people that or rocket ships. Um, there's rockets and launchers, and then there's rocket ships because we don't throw ships away. Um, I'm kind of the word police at times, but mm. uh, it, yeah. it's important. Words words have it's, meaning, right? It uh, is rocket ships rather than launch vehicles. Yes. Um, and and you know, and I was originally going to answer you by just saying whatever Joseph just said. That what he said was just right. <laughs> uh, we're at that moment, right? Like, I, and here's the thing: if imagine like, if we were in like the 1540s right now. And I was, we were at a cocktail party and I would be describing, or you would be describing, Lou, um, the music of the celestial spheres and how God put this perfect universe together and how the uh, the planets and the sun all rotate around the earth. And it's like, you know, it's, um, you know, around 1540, somewhere, something like that. And you'd be the rock star at the party. People would be um, gathered around you thinking you were a genius. Then in 1543 or so, Copernicus publishes his work. By 1550, you're an idiot, right? So there's the before and after. So if these folks pull off 100% reusability, and I tell people, it's not the day the Starship flies. It's the day the Starship flies, comes back, is refueled, and flies a second time. That's the day. After that, a thousand years from now, this is that's the day people are going to look at and say that's when it changed. And so any conversation we're having right now um, is going to be severely dated by what happens with whether it's Elon, whether it's Jeff, you know, whether it's any of these folks who get that reusability going. And so there's the, the economy today, the attitude, the strategic use of space. All of this is completely different the day after and so we have to keep that in mind okay and new worlds will open rick let me just stay with that for a second then i'll, I'll go back to barbara so but until we get there um you know you you talk about space in one of your ted talks the isa ted talk i think it was as an infinite canvas mm -hmm. which is the which is the way you know visionaries and big thinkers think about this in business or, or elsewhere um, you know, of course, Barbara is referring to, you know, making a profit within 10 years. Um, in between that time, be between the time we see ships doing exactly what you described uh, and sailing to the new world again, um, where do we see the, again, the role of government versus the role of the commercial sector moving? What, what, what can we expect? Where can investors uh, begin to sort of align their strategies? It's interesting. Um, one of your fellow New Yorkers, a, a good friend, the guy who taught me Washington, uh, Steve uh, Steve Wolf. Oh, sure. Uh, in 1988, um, I was kind of apprenticing with him when he was 
working with his his boss in in Washington, and they passed um, the Space Settlement Act of 1988. And for two years, I think it was two years, it was the law of the land that NASA's human spaceflight program was to enable the human settlement of space. And uh, Dan Golden uh, got rid of it under the Paperwork Reduction Act a few years later. And um, because it was like inconvenient because it, you know, they didn't want to have to report every year as to what, how they were doing things in a way that would enable the private sector. That was inconvenient for them. Um, It's still that way. And we have a a very large amount of work to do. Um, It is, we are, it's breadcrumbs. You're you're talking roadkill on the side of the road. It's more breadcrumbs Hmm. by the side of the table uh, in terms of what NASA thinks its job is. And by the way, this isn't NASA's fault, you know, right. other than the conspiracy of ideas that occurs between congressional staffers, aerospace lobbyists, NASA leadership, that they have this job, right? And part of that job is to feed the states, constituencies, centers, uh, aerospace companies, and to <laughs> look busy doing science and stuff. And that has to shift. But as it is, Within within NASA, and, and, and I want to give a shout out to the DOD as well, there is some spending that is heading out into the private sector, and mm-hmm. those breadcrumbs are feeding a lot of startups right. and a lot of companies. Right. You, Steve, you're not suggesting the government is somehow going to change. I mean, Jeff, Jeff Mamber, to his credit, uh, in 2009 when he went to NASA, you know, they were pretty open to what NanoRacks was proposing. But I, I don't I don't suspect you're you're saying that the way government approaches things is going to change. I mean, you just need to read Steve's novel to to understand mm-hmm. that, but you're yeah, saying well, something it, else, correct? It's just it's, for clarification. The government is the government. You get those breadcrumbs right. out there. Yeah. 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 It's just, it's, it's rather than breadcrumbs sliding off the table um, that they would actually hand them to us, you know, that kind of, yeah. L- looking at Artemis, for example. Um, and I, I don't want to get too ahead of ourselves here, but, When we're looking at Artemis, um, it needs to be restructured in such a way that from day one, it is purposeful that Artemis builds and leaves behind or hands off or helps catalyze through its spending the development of a vibrant private sector on the moon. Yeah. And so that's a shift. That's a very much of a shift. You know, and there's a pushback. I mean, we have Boeing coming out recently saying um, that they may not be able to survive uh, without the cost, uh, cost plus model. You know, which is kind of hilarious, and there are actually other big aerospace companies that are doing just fine without it. Um, so yeah, there there has to be a shift, um, but it it needs to be purposeful. They will do what they are told to do by Congress, and we see it in other parts of NASA all the time. I one of my guests, and I'll be quiet with this. One of my guests at the um, the New Worlds this weekend is Teddy Senedos from the uh, uh, JPL Ingenuity Helicopter Project. We're giving them an award. Um, what you see is in the um, in the exploration side of NASA, when they have a plan, it's really clear. We're going to go do this. We're going to make this thing happen. And they overperform almost every single time. I believe the human spaceflight side of NASA, if given clear parameters, that they're going to be judged on the civilian commercial infrastructure that they build and leave behind, mm-hmm. could do an excellent job at that. Yeah. I, I like that. That's very uplifting. Um, Barbara, you know, picking up on that and, and sort of bringing it back, as I said earlier, to Interstellar's model, um, you're looking at this sort of as a hard-nosed uh, entrepreneur. That's an American phrase, hard-nosed. Um, <laughs> you develop, as I understand it, controlled uh, environmental modules for for sustained farming on Earth and then life support uh on, on in, in space, but you're working with commercial companies um, here, oh, large nice. cosmetic companies and others, natural ingredients. What's what's the thinking behind that? Is that because it seems like a very practical uh, approach that you know you can embrace as an investor? Am I right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, well, there's a huge. <laughs> So, so the goal of the company has started everything to preserve life on Earth and bring life in space. To make it simple, to to 
to put a greenhouse on the moon and on Mars and to help life expand out of our planet. So when you want to do that, well, it's great. Uh, it's a, it's a great idea. But how do you make sure you can build a sustainable company? And there are, uh, I often say, there are not that many customers right now in space that want to buy a, a greenhouse. So, <laughs> so you better find uh, people who needs a greenhouse. And so well, people on Earth. So first Mars market is the Earth. Um, and and what's happening right now? So. So, okay, controlled environment module, a lot of AI um, uh, to automate the whole system, understanding how the environment is triggering the, not only the, the, the plant grows, but also how the plants, the biology of the plant, um, how it's producing nutrient, how it's producing molecule. Uh, and so we build those bubbles to, re to control the climate. And so we can really get the best of the plants. And it happened that on earth, the cosmetic, the naturally ingredient company. So every company that is extracting molecule from plants, is struggling because of climate change, because of geo geopolitical uh, problematics, because current agriculture is not sustainable because because it hasn't been designed as a closed loop, closed loop system. So there is a direct application of a technology that we initially conceptualized for space application. Um, so as a company, what we're doing is that we are expanding our terrestrial business, we're scaling it, um, and we're going to install a lot of our system. We're going to get better and better. Um, at controlling the environment, understanding the plant, building the library, uh, the, the the catalog, the plant catalog to to really um, uh, see how we can produce and accelerate plant growth, and then we'll use that in space. But there is the market on Earth is huge. Like our um, uh, uh, we, it's like a two hundred fifty billion. Um, um, uh, markets, the botanical ingredients markets. Um, it's used in in every product you use every day. Your yogurt, your perfume, your toothbrush, your, your toothpaste. Um, and so, and so as a, as a company, the strategy was like, okay, how do we tackle the largest market on earth, and how do we build a solution for them so we so we can scale our business before we put a greenhouse on the moon? Yeah. So again, that. We talked about a springboard, right? Um, not necessarily between government and commercial, but in your case, between earth development, the, the normal development yeah. of the business, um, and springboarding to space where a market yes. will evolve. How uh, how are you assessing the commercial space market? Because you've obviously, you know, got a plan. Are you are you looking at it and saying, you know, by twenty thirty four? this will be an X billion dollar business and we can move our cosmetic products there because of X and X okay. factors, which may or may not be influenced by the government uh, endeavors in space. So uh, it's a good question. Um, uh, so I, I'll explain, uh, I'll, 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 I'll talk about um, um, the science behind what we do and the link between earth and space mm -hmm. and how we are approaching commercial because there's a, a, this is the reason why. So a little bit of biology, very simple. If you play with stress, environmental stress, water stress, light stress, microorganism stress, a plant will have a reaction. And this reaction is to produce what is called secondary metabolites. So the molecules that are of high value for the cosmetic, the pharmaceutical, all those industry. The two most important stress that you can do to a plant is to put them in space because their lack of gravity and their solar radiation. So as a response to the stress, a plant will produce new molecule and will change the gene expression of its DNA. So it will adapt um, uh, its phenotype. That's very interesting for our terrestrial customer because there they can find new molecule. There they can find things that they won't be able to find on Earth. And so right now we are entering the natural ingredients market, the cosmetic, like all those guys who work, who work with them. What they, they're interested in our terrestrial system because it's like, it's it's amazing. <laughs> it's, well, so they, they, they love our product, um, uh, but they're also interested in the space application of what we do. And so what we're working on right now is uh, we work, we have a lunar mission that I can, I'm, I'm not gonna talk about today because the announcement coming very soon. We have a lunar mission, we have low Earth orbit mission where we design smaller version of our system. And we gonna we have government, governmental money, NASA money, a little bit of ESA money that much slower, uh, helping us financing the evolution of our product so we can build the hardware. But what we're as an offer very soon, like probably next year, 
Um, like we, we're already working on it. We're going to get a commercial partner, which is one of our terrestrial customers, because we can then take them into space and test the impact of solar radiation and lack of gravity on the plant's metabolite. And so it's much, it's going to happen much sooner um, than, than 10 years. Like right. I hope that next year I will be like, well, this lunar mission is financed by da, 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 L'Oreal or Shiseido or, or because there is real science behind it and they are willing to, to move. So it's not only NASA will finance installation of a greenhouse, but it's like the commercial companies. Right, right. Very good. Um, and, and thank you for explaining that to an English major. I actually understood it. So uh, that was very clear. <laughs> um, did L'Oreal, Tamara, didn't L'Oreal put a rocket up with Nicole Stott in the Super Bowl commercial? <laughs> so we've already done that. Um, yeah, true. <laughs> Rick, uh, you were nodding your head as Barbara was speaking. So I, I, it sounded to me like you were kind of embracing what she was saying. It had led me to think about what Deborah Werner had said earlier about innovation, that innovation won't stop. I mean, she's, Interstellar is probably a, a great example of it. Where do you see innovation uh, going and how do we sort of infuse more of it into uh, our industry and commercial sectors or do we need to? Yeah, I, um, and, and by the way, Barbara's, hopefully hopping on a plane uh, soon to come over here and join us um, at the uh, at the event and the Space Cowboy Ball, which we cap it off with. Um, the, the reason I was nodding and smiling is what I loved hearing Barbara talking about was her initial idea, right, is, you know, to build close, closed system biomes for space. And that's cool. And, you know, when you're doing that, you're thinking, okay, someday – government or private sector astronauts will live in these biomes. But what she's done as she's gotten onto, shall we say, the platform of that idea is gone sideways now. Because what she's looking at is what are the stress factors within the development of cellular, uh, you know, cellular development within a plant create these new. And so it's opening up. It's it's almost like a cascade effect. I guarantee you, and 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 I'm 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 bet you Barbara will agree that when they sit down in their meetings now, it's skyrocketing. I mean, there's so many different, and they have to sit down and go, oh no, we're only gonna focus on these because there's so many opportunities that are branching out mm -hmm. from the access to microgravity and lunar gravity. Um, so to answer that question, is innovation gonna stop? No, that's almost ridiculous. Uh, yeah. it, of course not. It's gonna, it's gonna go crazy. Um, one of the things I, I use in my talk uh, and I hate to cite myself, but I just got to make this point. Um, I wave around, I'll wave around the iPhone or the, the phone. I'll say, you know, okay, this is a application development platform de designed by the government and, um, you know, in the internet by extension and then given to the people and all hell broke loose. Now it's your connection to the global mind. Your grandmother can send you pictures of cats doing weird stuff. I mean, but it it's, it's transformed human existence. You know, we're probably going to have larger thumb or smaller thumbs, more nimble thumbs, you know, growing out of us. The point is we have transformed what it means to be a human being through access to this. Yeah. Right now, our access to the rest of the universe, our development platform is a space station. And my friend, uh, Bill Gerstenmeier, who used to be in charge of that program, told me it takes about 2.75 human hours um, to keep uh, to keep that station going, right? Um, or 2.75 of their time. Um, Daily? That means yeah. 2.75 people oh. just to keep the station running. I, I said it badly, forgive me. Gotcha. I, I um, gotcha. And normally you'll have between like three and six, maybe a little bit more sometimes people there. That means on a platform that's been developed to access the universe itself, the creative ability of the entire human species is, you know, 0.25 plus three to six other people. That's it for the entire human race to look at space, to play around with crazy ideas. And in other words, free time, experimental time, idea time. And, and you add in the uh, our friends over in the uh, Chinese station, now we're about with this rocket ship revolution that we're about to have. And we've got, I think, five commercial space stations that are viable in some form. Maybe it's down to four now. Mm -hmm. um, we're going to be allowing 
hundreds and thousands of human minds to go out into space and do what Barbara is doing with her company that started as Habitats for Astronauts. They're going to be the, 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 the flow of ideas coming back to the Earth, the startups, the IP that's going to be created. It's going to be a wave. It's going to be a flood. Yeah, it's it's a great vision, Rick, and you can envision it happening. Um, my colleague Joe Fargnoli has a question. Joe, we haven't been talking much about Artemis. Why don't you? I know you wanted to ask a question of uh, I think Rick on that. Well, I think I wanted to go back to a comment Rick made earlier about artists needing to be restructured to support a private space mission on the moon. Um, and I want to maybe uh, get a sense, Rick, of your vision of what would be the purpose of a private space mission on the moon. Because you also mentioned that if NASA were directed, they could do it. If major U.S. contractors were directed, they could do it. It seems like what we're lacking nationally is a vision, a unified vision of why we would want to have private enterprise on the moon. And it appears that we've got a bit of paralysis of will. We all know that we could we could knock this out as a country the second we got our act together and decided that was the thing to do. But let's say we've got you know 49 people here on this call voting. How would you help us to uh, be convinced that this is really what we should do? This is the way we should restructure the Artemis program. Um, I'll try and keep this short. It's it's an easy, long answer, um, but yeah, I got to keep it short. Right? Sorry. Try and keep it short here. Look, um, there's a space race going on. We know that China's going to the moon. Um, the last time we had a space race, we answered the Soviet nationalist space program with an American nationalist space program, right? Um, that was run by the government. Um, the way to do it this time is to unleash free enterprise, to unleash the private sector working with our government. If I'm putting tax dollars into something that's going to the moon, I, by God, don't want to be supporting a dead end like Apollo. I want that money to be leveraged into the development of capabilities for the private sector. One of, I'll give you an example. Let's say you want to house four astronauts on the moon. And by the way, we worked uh, a, a large group of people worked to set up the ability um, for SpaceX to carry and others to, to carry um, astronauts to the space station. Um, and what we were trying to get was a model where the government would support the development of that capability. And then the private sector, after taking care of the government's needs, could then do what it wanted with those capabilities. And it would mean a lowering of cost for everybody. Um, so imagine that you want to you want to put up four astronauts on the moon and you're the government. Put out a contract that says um, we will pay um, for the habitation that has all the good stuff in basically Barbara's modules would provide and or anybody else's uh, private sector. And um, we're also going to work with you. Um, and there's some points if you can make it for eight people or 10 people or 12 people. And our mission is only going to be there for four or five years, but we want to see a life capability of 10 years and you'll be rewarded for that. And when we're done with it, because see, NASA's internal um, psychology about the moon is they're practicing to go to Mars. That's that's all they care about. Mm -hmm. NASA's idea of a, a great success on the moon is uh, four or five people camping out for 30 days at a time somewhere in 2030s. That's not exciting. But I get that they want to practice. So let them practice and then let them purchase goods and services and make sure that all of the infrastructure they develop doesn't get thrown away. It gets, we have the four R's, reuse, recycle, repurpose, resources. And so that everything they build for Artemis, everything they do for Artemis is designed at its inception. This is really important. Not as an afterthought. Um, Deborah mentioned a term, I, I, I forgot what her term was, but it was a great term, um, but not as an afterthought, but that it's incepted, created with the idea that it's going to be handed to the private sector. Yeah, right. That's what we need so that our tax dollars become investments in catalyzing what's coming next. And it's not up to NASA to judge what that next is. It doesn't matter whether it's going to be a scientific outpost run by you know Harvard or um, 
I don't know, a, a Mormon gene storage, you know, vat at the bottom of a crater. It doesn't matter. It's not their job. Some vision up. Oh, I've got more, dude. <laughs> uh, but no, it, it could be any of these things. It's the private sector. You know, we do all right. kinds of crazy things that make money and advance civilization. But, but, but you know, again, Rick, this is a whole, yes, this is a whole uh, roundtable. It requires a lot of collaboration between government and the private sector. It almost requires us to become Taiwan uh, to be able to make it work that efficiently. But it's it's the it's the right thought. Um, to answer the question, uh, Niraf, thank you. Uh, Deborah's phrase was innovation theater. Yeah. So, like yeah. That. Hey, uh, Barbara, I'm going to um, close this at this segment uh, with you. Then we'll go to the New York Minute and then we'll come back to you guys for some questions. Just very quickly, what should the government be doing for you right now to enable, to enable Interstellar to do the kinds of things that Rick was describing, to get sort of the handoff or the support so that you can continue to thrive and hopefully spawn other entrepreneurial initiatives? Uh, launch a COTS program to build a greenhouse on the moon. <laughs> okay. Enough, well, right? just you asked the question. We're going to need them. <laughs> right? Uh, so, okay. That, that's fair enough. Um, it's like that, you know, it's like the, um, who's the movie where the guy got stuck on Mars and he had to do Martian? that. Yeah, the Martian? Martian. Yeah, the Martian. Yeah, the Martian. Something like that, but more, more <laughs> planned and programmed. All right. Uh, well, listen, thank you both for that segment. We're going to be back to you with some uh, audience questions and some more questions. But before we do that, uh, this is the New York Space Business Roundtable. Joe, um, let's give us the New York Minute. What'd you hear? What made you happy? What made you pissed off? Well, it was a great conversation. I think we addressed the uh, the topic that we we sort of laid out um, in a very monumental manner. I really appreciated the comment that Rick offered about the importance of unleashing the private sector, working with the U.S. government. And thinking of the historical perspective of the era of 1540 to 1550 and the fact that we are at this monumental inflection point in the reduction of launch cost and you know the the new worlds that that's going to make available so i think this 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 need to create this new vision for artemis to reduce this paralysis of will to build this unity of vision and to unleash the private sector working with the us government is on our doorstep this is not something that has to happen down the road and I don't think this is something that happens in the halls of Congress or in the research tanks. I think it happens with the, the generality of the commercial space community. And, you know, I have, I have a comment, but I also have a question. How do we pull together as a community and help the government work through models whereby they can unleash the power of the private sector and working with the government? There are a number of constraints, a number of issues. I, I don't know that everyone in the government wants to trust Elon for the future of, you know, U.S. launch. However, there is probably a model there where portions of that could possibly be dedicated to U.S. missions in a way that does not leave it at the winds of Elon or Jeff or any other launch provider. So, you know, with every major shift historically in the impact of technology, there's a major set of considerations in the regulatory, uh, ethical, economic realm that have to be embraced. So I think, as Rick said, we are at a super exciting time. I look, I really hope that the regulatory issues I worked through and SpaceX can launch on Friday and they have a successful launch and relanding. Um, but I'm, you know, in my in my time here, I really want to call on this community to think about how can we advocate. I mean, the government has put out feelers, the government has programs to try to work with commercial industry. How can we cooperate with these government efforts to propose new models? To address exactly what Rick, what Rick uh, talked about, right? Finding ways to create a, an enduring commercial legacy that goes along with the pioneering development work that the government puts into these things. So, you know, I think once again, it comes down to we the people to come together and build this unity of vision of what a, uh, a future U.S. space industry can look like with, with more hybridization of commercial and government and how we can overcome this paralysis of will and take ownership of this issue to drive our country forward and to help ensure that the um, the pattern of freedom that we have here on Earth is propagated in space. Very good, Joe. Um, to, to paraphrase Ronald Reagan, who we started this with, let the USA be the USA. 
and it will do great things uh, for itself and for uh, entrepreneurs in the world going forward. Um, well, listen, we're going to um, close this segment and then we'll come back. And there, there are some questions out there, including one from Deborah Werner. So uh, we'll bring her on to ask. Um, but in the meantime, I just want to, Tamara and I want to take you through some things that are coming up. Just uh, saw the New York Minute. We adopt tickets are on sale now for the December 4th dinner in London, the Better Satellite World Awards dinner. And you can meet uh, the recipients of that award and, of course, uh, the UK Person of the Year. Uh, that's always a great festive event, terrific networking event. Everybody from the industry is there. So uh, we encourage you to get tickets or tables for that. You'll, you'll really have a, I'm telling you, you'll have a great time if you come to London. Tamara, you want to uh, take this on? This is our SSPI WISE meeting tomorrow. Anything we need to know further? Sure. So we've been exploring various ways of making sure that we are developing and retaining talent and especially female talent in our industry. Uh, tomorrow's SSPI WISE, just FYI, it's a week early because obviously next week, Thursday is Thanksgiving. So we'll have our uh, New York uh, SSPI WISE event tomorrow. And we are exploring mentorship, but from the perspective of the mentee. So um, if some of you have heard our podcast uh, last couple of weeks, you have been hearing from the mentor of the year, Deborah Factor, and she was giving some really good insights about the value of mentorship and how she sees it. Tomorrow, we're going to hear from mentees, uh, part of the SSPI Wise Very Successful Mentee Program. Uh, and so I encourage you to be there tomorrow. Great. Thank you. And uh, if you haven't subscribed to our podcast, we drop one every Monday and you can get it wherever you get your podcasts. And, um, you know, as Tamara said, we've, we've got some great sessions going on uh, with that. Um, I also would encourage you to look at the uh, Space Business Qualified Program, which we didn't show this week. But if, you know, you're looking to bring on talent and train them and get them to learn about the industry. That's a terrific program. That's a space business qualified. Next uh, month on December 20th, we're gonna stay in New York. Or we're gonna stay in New York State. We're gonna talk about uh, Tonawanda, New York, among other places. We're using Tonawanda, but can the commercial space industry lift boats in the way that Rick and Barbara and Deborah were describing to the extent that it is beginning to create a sort of post-industrial economy for parts of the world, uh, including this country in New York State, that were hard hit in the industrial uh, age, the, the sort of the post-industrial hangover. So we're going to be looking at examples, which Deborah and others have actually written about around the country. And we're going to, we're going to dig into that right here in New York State and get some real world uh, data on what's happening. So uh, make sure you sign up for that on December 20th. And we really appreciate you coming here every month for this round table. Okay, we're gonna go back to questions. Um, I'm gonna give the first question, of course, to our colleague, Deborah Werner. Deborah, you had a you had a sort of a, I don't know if it was a question or a complaint, but uh, go ahead. No, it's a, it's a question. I would love to hear people's thoughts on, on what the obstacles are to the government taking advantage of private sector innovation and agility and speed. Um, and this is for the audience too, by the way, but I'm gonna, Rick, what, what's the problem? Why can't government uh, do a faster take up? You know, Eisenhower warned us about the establishment of the aerospace industrial complex after World War II. And so we've got a legacy system, um, you know, and uh, somebody mentioned the FAR um, we have the system that has been built up that is based uh, almost more on a, uh, a quasi-commercial lobbyist-led sort of acquisition and lack of vision. I mean, if we, again, if we had a president who stood up and said, we are going to establish, forgive me, Barbara, but American communities on the moon, Mars, and in free space. And the job of NASA is to go and do the Lewis and Clark gig, check it all out, tell us what's out there. And we're going to invest our tax dollars, whether it's DOD or NASA, in supporting the development of all these resources, et cetera, which, by the way, in a 
different version is exactly what China's doing. Um, we could go out there and make all this happen. It's cultural, largely. It's really cultural. It's not that NASA's evil or any of this, or it's not like anybody in a state that's saying, gimme, 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 is evil. Johnson set that up to make sure that Apollo was unkillable. Well, the problem is, you know, now it's spread out everywhere and the system is unkillable. Um, so we just have to switch and and go towards a, a new way of operating and and try and figure workarounds and and ways that uh, NASA can have its successful mission um, and be judged in a way by how the private sector. The, the only other choice here is that NASA human spaceflight um, is just going to find itself more and more and more obsolescent. Um, you know, just like the SLS sitting there is an obsolete vehicle the day after Starship successfully flies two times. Mm -hmm. And we've invested, what, $23 billion or more in it. Mm -hmm. um, so we have to, um, and, and again, I, I, you know, my friend Steve Wolf and, and there's uh, the organization, um, God, I just blanked on the name. Space Port Alliance? Uh, no, no, no. The hmm. uh, um, trying to plug uh, you, Steve. Yeah, the uh, the group they have in DC on policy and the Space Frontier Foundation are the two organizations um, that are working hard to establish policies that are pro pro community, pro human community. Um, and by the way, trying to use new language. It's important yeah, to... yeah, language is important. You you got that right. We're not it's... doing colonies now. We're doing human communities beyond the earth. Right, well, and, and we always do, we always thrive in community. But, you know, politics is downstream of culture, Rick. So if you're saying it's a cultural problem, you're, you're responding to Deborah that it's a cultural problem. That's that's a pretty entrenched entity. And if you look historically, I guess, at the United States, you referred to Kennedy's mission to, Mar to uh, the moons, to the moon. I mean, that was driven largely by fear. Um, Americans are an aspirational people we move on our aspirations, right? So if we put the language in the context of aspiration, maybe we've got a better chance. But if it's cultural, then you have to influence politics uh, through the cultural aspiration. And I don't see a lot of aspiration in politics. That's that's personal privilege there as an editorial. Um, Barbara in France, I mean, is it different? Does, does, is the relationship different? Different culture, uh, different politics. So I stay most of my time in the United States, so I'm not that French, <laughs> except for my accent. <laughs> okay. Um, um, well, you're the only you're the resident expert right now. If you, if you want to comment on? Well, that. so 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 to to be fair, every time I start a company, I it's always a U.S. company with a French subsidiary. There is something about America and inspiration and and being willing to do what can be qualified in Europe as impossible. Um, that here you have the um, the way of thinking and 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 the the the, the people love entrepreneur people there, there is something about you know um, uh, changing the statu quo questioning things moving forward innovating and inspiring the world that is very true in America and that's why I'm here and I and and that's why every company I start I started from 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 United States because because this is the this is the country of uh, entrepreneurship and uh, this is where you know, it's it's leading innovation. So, so Rick, you might have your view on NASA as a European perspective. NASA is amazing, and and I and I love NASA. And without NASA, um, um, you know, um, they they inspired so many so many entrepreneurs, and and um, and um, uh, and and and, and still, they, you know, if if you, it's funny if you look around the around the world and in the streets of Paris, when you walk around, you have so many people wearing T-shirts with the NASA logo. Yeah. No one knows about ESA. No one cares about the spa the it's French true. space agency. It's true. Like no one knows its name, the CNES, but everyone knows of NASA. And and because no, it's, it, <laughs> yeah. So maybe we're a little hard on ourselves here. Yes, um, exactly. With, with That's the, to... This is what I'm trying to say. To say a little, little and um, but Europeans are trying hard, and and the French government has be, has been doing a lot of um, um uh, a lot of effort trying to you know follow uh, the 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 American innovative spirit. Uh, just a quick one, which is very funny. I had this so so I was at this gathering at the 
uh, with the, the president, Mr. Uh, Monsieur Macron, a um, French president, and he was presenting the, the France 2030, the program and, and in what they want to invest. And one of the key sectors is it's space. And there was the older management team from Ariane who was sitting there in the in the in the Palais de l'Elysée, so the the residence of the of the president. And during three minutes, he only spoke about SpaceX, and 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 how SpaceX completely changed the market by building reusable rockets. And I remember seeing in front of me all the executive management from Ariane. Um, and so so well, what I want to say is that the the French and the the European are very aware. There are a lot of things that need to change if they want to be able to, you know, be in this race, in the space race. And 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 yeah, and NASA and United States are still leading it. Leading it so, and, and it goes back to culture, doesn't it? I mean, it, it does. I think it's so. Not, if it's not in the culture, it may not be in the politics uh, on a regular basis. So that's why, um, you know, Rick goes up to uh, the hill and tries to tell him, you know, what should be done. So. Um, Tamara, you had a question. Uh, I did. I did. And, I, I, you know, please bear with me, but I'm going to put this question to both Rick and Barbara just as a as a hypothetical, if I can. Um, I have a concern, right? We're talking about the transition between governments and, and, and um, commercial, and we're aware that you know, I like the way Rick put it, that government should be laying us some breadcrumbs so that whatever they build, commercial enterprise can follow on. Um, I, I love the vision. I have a question about what what is government's actual need? And, and my question is driven by the current climate of, say, for instance, social media, right? Right now we have entirely independent social media. It's privately owned. It has an outsized impact on our society. And the government really is having a hard time catching up to dealing with all the ways in which that it's impacting, you know, misinformation, et cetera. And, and, and there is no government equivalent to compete with social media as it exists today. So is there a legitimate place for government where they really should be kind of exclusive in, in the space race? Who do you want to start with, Tim? You know, I, let's start with Barbara. <laughs> What, what do you mean um, uh, uh, that government should be exclusive? Well, in other words, is there is there a place for government to really be the, the, the owner of or the or the owner of record for the technology as opposed to it being led by the commercial industry or or more more dominated by commercial? Is there a reason why governments might need that? Uh... National security, um, I, that kind of thing. Yeah, so I don't know what to answer. <laughs> um, uh, I'd, yeah. You want to throw it to Rick and then yeah. come back? Rick, you want to pick that up? Oh, yeah. Um, <laughs> the, the government is uh, it's a cheerleader. It has security needs. It has a large amount of capital to invest, um, but it can also set the way forward in in the scientific realm. I was talking earlier about NASA's non-human stuff, the JPL stuff. That sort of activity for now, although I can see ways where it could provide, be profitable, that sort of activity, which is pure science, Absolutely. That's government. Let's invest our, our taxpayer dollars um, and, and let's go explore Saturn or Pluto. There's not going to be a lot of profit in that. Um, let's find out about the universe, the galaxy. Let's send these beautiful mm -hmm. telescopes up. Now, as they're doing it, we could work out systems in which the private sector you know, can benefit to a maximum degree. If you keep in mind that scientists just want data. They don't care how many political districts or how many centers or how much money was peeled off by whatever companies before they get their data. All they want is their data. So if we could figure out ways to get them more data, um, then that's great. But I do believe that the government can go out there. There's also 
one that, and I, I don't want to get real dark here for a minute, but this has really been troubling me. I'm, I'm working on something. I'm writing about it right now. Um, Elon, Jeff, all these people are going to open the gates up. We have all these private space facilities and we have people that are going to go up there and um, they're going to go have sex in space, which I love. Here's my, here's the Velcro, go have a good time. But when it comes to reproduction in space, I'm terrified of that right now because nobody knows what happens when a baby is conceived or born in space. And I see a four coming, I, I foresee a disaster coming because somebody's going to pay to go to a private space facility and they are going to inseminate. They are going to start the cycle of life. And that child is going to come back. And there's a likelihood that there's going to be issues with that child. And everybody's going to, in our field, will be blamed. And there'll be a ban on humanity going into space. Worst case scenario. The government, I what, believe. What's wrong with that, Rick? What, what would be the problem there? Is, would the, the kid be discriminated against or what? what? No, no. The, the actual Wait, cycle. I, I mean, oh, I for, the, uh, for the egg to go down the tubes, I think you need gravity. We don't know. Nobody knows. Right. We have two sessions at New Worlds this year on that very topic. There's okay. a company out there, by the way, called Spaceborn that wants to, to fly eggs and sperm and things like that in space. The government should be in there and the private sector. You know, my friend Elon and these guys, before they go waving their hands and say, ah, it's your problem. You know, we're just going to get you there. We need to figure this one out. Yeah, it's a great right? problem. That gives us that gets us into ethics too, right? I actually there's an ethics to it, but there's also science. Science can answer ethics with, mm. you know, we actually, and I'll, I'll wrap this up real quick here. But originally, the space station that Reagan promised us um, had centrifuges, so we could learn about these things. The reason NASA hasn't done research into what happens in reproduction. This goes back to those first principles and core ideas is because their mission is only to go on camping trips. So they've never been told mm -hmm. to worry about what happens in generation two, three or four in right. space. If that was part of their mission at the highest level, then they could invest into the research and we could know what's going to happen. Can we actually have children on the moon or in free space or on Mars? We don't know. Mm -hmm. The experiments that have been done haven't been that positive. Hmm. By the way, I did a podcast on sex in space with artificial intelligence, robots and stuff like that. That there turned out to be fun, but you're talking about something obviously much more. I'm not talking about the sex. Substantial. Yeah, that. no, I, I get you. Steve the Wolf's results. probably Steve Wolf's probably thinking about that. Maybe we'll have him on next time to talk <laughs> about that. Um, I've got people backed up here. Um, Andrea Malater, you want to come on and uh, respond to one of Rick's comments? And then, Joe, I think you've got another question. Andrea's still with us. Andrea's still with us. She needs to be able to unmute. Andrea, you're unmuted. Thank you. So uh, I was commenting on Rick's point earlier that it's not exactly the government, but the commercial companies that have become entwined with the government in um, all of the space activities. And and back in 1962, you didn't have that. I mean, you had the military industrial complex, but they weren't into communication. So um, the Communication Satellite Act basically let communication satellites be a private um, development in the US. The rest of the world said, no, it's part of our Ministry of Telecommunications or whatever. But, and and while ATT, Washington Union, ITT were all investors, they only owned half the company. The rest was owned by private people like little me, whose father bought her her 10 shares. and. <laughs> So, but they didn't stop it from happening because they hadn't become so completely entwined because the space industry was just starting. And I don't know if it's possible to um, to undo that now. Mm -hmm. so. Okay. Um, I'm interjecting thanks. just very briefly. Thank you, um, everyone. So far, we are at 112, which means we have three minutes left. So Lou, okay. over back to you. Thanks, Tamara. Uh, Joe, you um, had a comment or a yeah, question? Just one quick question. I think you know our discussion has highlighted the need for the commercial space 
enthusiasts to have their voice heard about creating this new vision for the use of space. My question to Rick and Barbara, what platforms on which can, um, I mean, through what channels or what platforms or what consortia can the average space enthusiast join to try to bring these voices together so that they're heard? Barbara, you want to go first? And, and uh, I, I don't answers. Yep. Yeah, I, I, uh, um, I don't know. <laughs> the national, <laughs> like there are different, there are a lot of organization that you can find. Rick, you know all of them. Um, <laughs> which which, you which is your favorite? Being, which is your favorite? Which one? I don't have as favorites. An I'm not a, as an entrepreneur. Uh, well, I, I don't, I don't, I don't have favorite ones. Is it, you, okay? Aside from SSPI, you mean? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Great. This is the best one. <laughs> yeah, okay. That's, that's fair enough. Rick, over to you. Uh, yeah, well, first of all, um, dog groomers have enthusiasts. We have revolutionaries. Um, uh, this is not about enthusiasts. This is about a revolution. And um, look, I, yeah, you guys certainly, I, I I started the L5 on the Intrepid back in 84. So I'm a big New York uh, supporter. Um, the Space Frontier Foundation right. uh, has gone full circle and is going back to its roots of policy. Um, I'm excited about that. Uh, the organization I was trying to recall earlier uh, that Steve and other foundationers are part of is called Beyond Earth. They're yeah. doing some great policy work. Frank White's involved there, right? Yeah. So there's a lot of, there, those are the two big ones that are, to me, um, walking the halls in D.C., um, cause it's easy to get caught up in fandom and enthusiasts clubs, you know, and let's all go dance for space and all that. We need to actually get in there and, and tell our politicians and, you know, that we want these things done. And by the way, also tell the private sector guys, right. You guys need to be responsible and do your job too. Right. It, well, I think that's a great way yeah. to end it. Um, this, this has been a terrific conversation, and I really appreciate you both coming on and making the time for us today. We we could do this again and again and again. Um, this is actually a course. Joe, thanks so much. I think we covered a lot of ground today, and I'll see you next month. Uh, Tamara, as always, you're the uh, conductor of the orchestra. I think they played beautifully. It was so a wonderful thank for... conversation. Thank you, Barbara. Thank you, Rick. Uh, thank you, everyone in the chats for contributing. And uh, some of you, if you're going to be in New York, so will I tomorrow. So I hope to see you there. Have a great evening. <laughs> Take care. And a final shout out to the team at SSPI, especially Ari Yates, who did our graphics and some of the work. Thanks, Ari, out in L.A. Take care, everybody. We'll see you next month uh, on December 20th. And remember, let's keep let's really make it a better satellite world. We can do it, as Rick and Barbara have been directing us. Take care.